Hi, everybody. This is David Paul. Thank you for attending this webinar today on the HOV medium pressure UV. Um, I'll be instructed just doing a quick introduction, and then Dennis Bitter will be giving uh, the details. This is a three part series on UV. Today, we have HOD, and then a couple of weeks from now, we have another medium pressure UV, and then December 12th, we have low pressure UV. So it'll be a 45 minute presentation. I'll give maybe 10 minutes and then Dennis will give the balance and then we'll have 15 minutes of Q&A. If you have any questions, please type them in at any time uh, into the question or the chat box and then we'll cover that at the end. You'll receive an email right after this webinar with three questions just so we can get some feedback on how satisfied you are with this webinar. Please fill that out because it doesn't take any time at all. This uh, presentation is being recorded and it'll be available next week on our website. You'll also receive a thank you email from us in the next day or two and it'll have a PDF of this presentation. So just uh, make sure that you're aware that this isn't a financial relationship between us and these UV companies, that we, we just present our webinars to our clients uh, as something that we feel is of value and interest. I've been in uh, high-tech water treatment a long time. I've been in lots of plants, have a master's of science degree, microbiology, and also level four certified with DHP. Dennis Bitter is going to talk about the HOD UV. He's been in the business for 35 years, lots of experience, including NALCO and Sever Severin Trent, and degree in chemistry, chemical engineering from University of Illinois, and an MA in business administration. So I'm just going to give a real quick uh, intro to ultraviolet radiation and turn it over to Dennis. So UV is just part of the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, what you and I are seeing right now is in the visible range of the spectrum. UV is a little shorter wavelength. When you say wavelength, here's a wave, and it actually is the, the wavelength, the, 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 usually in nanometers when we're talking about UV. So 100 to 400 nanometer is in the UV range. So scientists looked at, you know, just like everybody knows that they found that x-rays, an application for x-ray is you could shoot these x-rays through the body and the bones would stop it, but the soft tissue wouldn't. Well, they looked at, you know, how are we going to use this UV radiation? Well, they found that, you know, you really got 100% effectiveness in TOC, total organic carbon reduction, at maybe like 170 nanometers. And you could destroy ozone, uh, maybe 150, 255 or so. Uh, you could inactivate bacteria at maximally at maybe 265 or something like that. Well, then the scientists had to look for, you know, what could we use to actually generate this type of wavelength? Well, if you energize sodium, Na, you get visible light. If you energize potassium, K, you get visible light. If you energize mercury, Hg, you get UV light. So these UV lamps are going to be mercury-based. They come in two flavors for water treatment, low pressure and medium pressure, and that's the pressure inside of the lamp. So the low pressure UV, it emits wavelengths, two wavelengths primarily. So 185 nanometer, and that's used for TOC, organics destruction, and, 250, and 254 nanometer, which is used for bacterial inactivation and ozone or chlorine destruct. So a low pressure lamp puts out both the 185 and the 254 wavelengths but only about 5% is 185 nanometer, and about 90% is 254 nanometer, and then the balance 5% is, is just kind of scattered. So if you want a, a 254 nanometer lamp, then the manufacturer coats the lamp with a dopant that will actually absorb the 185 nanometer, it won't let it come out, so that way only 254 nanometer comes out. 
So, and again, the 254 nanometer is really good at bacterial in inactivation and really good at ozone and chlorine destruction. If you want a 185 nanometer lamp, you get a lamp that doesn't have the dopant on it, but you still get 90% 254 nanometer that's coming out. So the 185 nanometer, great for TOC destruction. Uh, because the 185 nanometer is only putting out about 5% of the 185, um, then these systems are usually going to be bigger. You're going to have more lamps in order to do the job, or you put them next to a tank and you recirculate the tank through them. So it's, it's important to know that even though it's a 185 nanometer system, or lamp that's being used, it is producing the 254 nanometer radiation, so it's also going to inactivate bacteria and destroy ozone. The medium pressure UV, it takes more energy, but it also puts out a whole lot more energy. It has, it doesn't have just to, the two spikes of uh, UV radiation, it has even visible light but still, there's so much more UV that comes out that one medium pressure lamp is equivalent to about 16 low pressure lamps. So the HOV UV is a medium pressure technology, and we're gonna to get to that here in just a few seconds. So just as an example for pre-RO, find, I, at least I see it more in pharmaceutical and biotech that you have a UV in front of an RO unit uh, for bacterial inactivation and or dechlorination. So that particular industry, I think more commonly uses the UV up front. There are other industries that do too, but as an industry as a whole, I think you find it more in that industry. Post RO is very common if you need lower TOC. So when you get to really high purity water like semiconductor microelectronic type water, you use 185 nanometer UV to destroy the uh, TOC. And then if you want less than a part per billion of TOC, you use ozone enhanced 185 nanometer UV. And then finally, just before the final filter, before the water goes you know, to the end users to the loop, it's uh, common to have a 254 nanometer UV for bacterial inactivation. Okay, so that's it for me. I'm going to turn this over to Dennis at this point to give you the details of HOD UV. Uh, thank you, David. I'd like to thank uh, David H. Paul Training and uh, for allowing me to present to you today. And I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining me on this presentation. A walk away. What I hope you walk away from in my presentation is a, a better appreciation, an understanding of the difference of an HOD UV versus traditional UV. And more importantly, I'd like you to understand why that's significant. So let me get started. The uh, HOD UV technology is revolutionary science for powerhouse boiler feed water and cooling water applications. So it is a non-chemical control that can improve membrane performance, increase water quality, and significantly lower, lower operating costs through increased efficiencies. It's a proven chemical-free dechlorination disinfectant that effectively removes free available chlorine and, of course, the, har the associated harmful effects, uh, eliminates or significantly reduces the biofouling in the membrane, eliminates the scaling due to overfeed of bisulfite, uh, decreases the RO or the, the CIPs in the membrane, uh, reduce maintenance, and improves the overall membrane performance and cycle water chemistry. It's environmentally friendly, simple, safe, safe for the water and the employees. It's uh, no, ha no hazardous and chemicals. It's non-corrosive, easy to control, maintain, and what I'm going to say is the best overall value. So what is it? It's a cutting edge, environmentally friendly, disinfectant solution based on a new generation of UV technology. What I'm going to say is it's a new era in water treatment and disinfection. But before I actually tell you, show you the HOD UV, I want you to know something. The HOD UV has validations and acceptances not seen by any other UV science. Now, the first one is 
It's for law removal of the adenovirus. So Atlantium went out to an independent organization, and they're the only U the HODUV is the only one that went to get achieved for log removal through the independent organization. The pasteurization of the water used in milk meets an FDA PMO standard. That standard is typically met by a thermal process. Uh, Atlantium recognized that and saw that, or they came along and took the HODUV and validated it for that process. Um, and indeed, it's become a leader in the dairy market. If you know nothing else about the science itself, um, let me tell you about the ordering pattern of Coca-Cola. Uh, five or six years ago, uh, Coca-Cola ordered two systems. They studied it for two years. In the next four years, they ordered over 300 systems. In the beverage industry, many of them use UV over chemistry because chemistry adds taste and odor. What that meant was they went in and took out the, the traditional UV and used the HODUV. Atlantium has been a leader in the aquaculture market. Uh, recently, in the last five years, uh, the HODUV has been heavily studied by the Bureau of Reclamation along the lower Colorado River. Uh, at Davis Dam, Parker Dam, and Hoover Dam, and at the end of the presentation, I'll show you some, share some of those results. But more recent, what we'll focus on today is the dechlorination prior to an RO. Uh, studied heavily in the pharmaceutical industries with uh, uh, dozens of the facilities using the HODUV, and recently um, the power industry uh, studied that plant Bowen. So here it is. Here's the technology, and before I leave this slide, I want to point out something about it, the technology. It's, it's modular in concept. So as you look here, there's a face plate. You have the hydro-optic section. You have a lamp, hydro-optic, lamp, hydro-optic, lamp, hydro-optic, and a face plate. Because it's modular in concept, we can, take, we can take the face plate off and add on additional lamps or hydro-optic sections if more energy is needed. And, and the, just the opposite, if less is needed, you can take off a lamp and hydro-optic section and reduce it to the face plate and make it smaller. So going back to uh, the UV 101, uh, the medium pressure lamp works in the 200 to 300 nanometer range. And essentially the dose is calculated by the UV transmittance and the dose is in millijoules per centimeter squared or, or the energy in and the energy in centimeter squared. It's the UVT, the transmittance of the water, the flow rate plus the lamp power, plus the UV apparatus. What uh, my experience is, is the UV apparatus of the HOD UV is a plus sign, it's a positive sign. When you look at traditional UV and all the inefficiencies in the way the energy is applied into the water, it's actually a minus sign and detracts from, from, the, from the application. So let me show you why, and let me tear it apart. So in front of you is a what looks like a, a UV system, a traditional UV, and uh, let me tear it apart. It's a flange-to-flange -flange pipe with a UV. So there's the stainless steel, and the water flows on through. The success of the HOD UV is based upon three sciences. The first science is a medium pressure lamp. The medium pressure lamp puts out the correct germicidal spectrum. Now, the one thing different about the Lantium's medium pressure lamp than other uh, corporations' medium pressure lamp is it allows energy to modulate in and out of the lamp. It's, it's met to a certain specification made for the HODUV. And you'll see why that's significant when I come to the third science itself. The second science is the internal reflection or the hydro optic. Essentially, the uh, internal reflection bounces the energy throughout that entire chamber. It increases the, the wavelength and it's throughout that chamber. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say, let's say this lamp is putting out exact, you know, it wants to control cryptosporidium. And if you want to control crypto, you need an energy level of 46 millijoules per centimeter squared. If you hit it with 46, you got it. If you hit it with anything less than 46, you don't get it. So this is putting out 46. And the first thing to note about traditional UV systems is this is the, the metal adsorbs the dose. 
like a lightning rod, it takes the energy out of the water and into the metal itself. So if it's close to the lamp itself, it's getting 46. But if you're closer to the metal, you find a lot of dead zones uh, throughout the, that they're close to the metal. On just the opposite side, that 46 is being recycled throughout that entire chamber and get hit, hit by several times. I'm going to give you another example. Along the lower Colorado River, we did a it was done, independent study was done where they knew that the Quagua Villager was controlled with an energy level of 100 millijoules per centimeter squared. When they set up a traditional UV system and operated at 100 millijoules, they had 70% efficacy. When they set up the HOD UV system at 100 millijoules, they had 100% efficacy. And what they decided, because the efficacy was so high, they said, let's see if we can go lower. And they went from 100 millijoules to um, 80 to 60 to 40 down to 20, milli, um, 20 millijoules coming out of the lamp itself. And essentially what happened was the 20 millijoules concentrated in the middle of that chamber that almost, so the chamber mimicked practically 100 millijoules. Essentially, even at 20 millijoules, the HOD UV had 90% efficacy in controlling the, in controlling the organism. And essentially, the HOD UV has the hydro-optic chamber on each side, and because of its efficiency of bouncing the energy around and concentrating it, uh, it hits both sides, and there's no dead zones inside the HOD UV. And this is an example here of the, of the, the light path that flows on through, bounces it around, or how it mimics fiber optic science. The third science is just simply logic, controls, sensors, and an algorithm. Every lamp in an HOD UV system has two sensors. The first sensor is an efficiency sensor. And let's go back to the example of cryptosporidia. So if you're trying to control crypto, you need 46 millijoules per centimeter squared. But as soon as you turn on the lamp, the lamp starts to, to degrade. And in short order, as it's degrading, it's no longer able to treat or be at 46 millijoules or be able to treat for crypto. In the HODUV, the efficiency sensor it picks up that degrading of the lamp. It goes into an algorithm, and the algorithm then starts to pump energy into the lamp. Like the horse with blinders, it says, I need to maintain 46 millijoules per centimeter squared. And as it's degrading, it's pumping energy in the lamp with the sole purpose to maintain the 46. The next sensor is a UVT meter on every lamp. And the UVT meter measures the UV transmittance of the water, or essentially the water quality itself. And let me give you an example. Let's say a storm kicks up. The turbidity goes up, the UV transmittance go down, goes down, and as it goes down, uh, the algorithm says we need to pump energy into the lamp, and the lamp itself maintains the, uh, the, the desired dose that's set, set up for. As the storm clears up, the, the energy leaves the lamp, and then it's still with the sole purpose of maintaining the, the energy inside the, inside the chamber. The third thing is it can tie into a, a, a flow meter that's separate from the system. The flow meter can take a signal into, our, into the HOD UV, and as the flow increases, it'll, it'll put energy into the lamp, and as the flow decreases, it'll take energy out of the lamp. This is the control panel itself. And and again, every lamp in the system, in this system example here, we have eight lamps. Every lamp has two sensors per lamp. And every, every sensor is measuring the, the power or energy inside of it, adjusting it. It's measuring the UV transmittance and adjusting versus the flow and adjusting. And then according to the calculation at the beginning, so it measures the actual delivered dose versus the required delivered dose. So what's the required delivered dose and why is that important? And here's an example. So when you look at traditional UV, and in traditional UV there's a lot of inefficiencies in delivering that energy into the water. And because of that inefficiencies, it's commonly referred to as the average dose. And of course average is that. In this example here, the average energy is 30 millijoules per centimeter squared. So 
if your average dose is 30 millijoules and you need 30 millijoules in your system, that means half the time you're treating, the other half the time you're not treating. So when I say, you know, what I meant, or let me say, every organism has a number. And when I say a number, that means the, the number that it takes to inactivate it. And of course, we talked about cryptosporidia being 46, um, bacillus is 50, pseudomonas is 14, E. coli is 8, legionella, which is a, a, a very common or interested these days, is 9. Okay, so the average dose is not the real dose. So when I look at this example here, I'm trying to draw you over to the left-hand page. In the left-hand page, you can see everything near the lamp on a traditional UV system can get treated, but as closer you get to the metal, everything along the metal is, is, is not getting treated or a dead zone. And except in, essentially, the, when you look at a traditional UV, they have lots of lamps in there, and the lots of lamps um, have dead zones inside there. With the HOD UV, Everything is efficiently delivered into the water and eliminates that lower section. What I'm going to say here is what's in front of you is the holy grail of UV. Why? It's because every UV company has been trying to figure out how to optimize their technology or their system to deliver more energy into the, into the water itself. This little firm out of Israel, Atlantean, has done that. So now let's take a look at uh, chemical-free dechlorination to protect boiler feed water. So uh, the free available chlorine, and typically in the pH range that the uh, 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 boiler water system is operated, you have your hypochlorous acid and your hypochlorite ion. With an HODUV or the energy, you take a UV photon, you hit, you dissociate the oxygen from the chloride and separate it, and you separate it. And that takes over the, uh, removes the oxidative ability of the free available chlorine. And when you look at the chemistry itself, along with the UV lamp and the free available chlorine, your hypochlorous and hypochlorite ion, you see it ends up in, with the inert chloride ion. Now, when you look at traditional chemistry with bisulfite and sodium metabisulfite, and here's the, uh, the chemistry itself, it ends up in the same location and then the exact same amount of an inert chloride ion. Now when we look at the medium pressure lamp versus the free available chlorine, we see the wavelength of the, of the hypochlorous and the hypochlorite ion. As we've seen before, here's a, here's a wavelength of a medium pressure lamp, and here's the wavelength of a low pressure lamp. And we, if we outlay the free available chlorine, your hypochlorous and your hypochlorite ion, we can see that the medium pressure lamp makes the biggest impact on removing and dissociating the, the free available chlorine. Further, one of the things that we're seeing with the free available chlorine is it's we're operating, we're operating the system at a thousand millijoules. By operating at a thousand millijoules to dissociate that, that free available chlorine, uh, we see that we're, all, we're controlling the EPS, the extra polymeric cellular substance that gets onto the membrane or the bug glue. Simple disinfection is somewhere between you know, 50 to 150 millijoules. To dissociate the free available chlorine, we're at 1,000. Essentially, we're an order of magnitude higher and able to control uh, all the bacteria that's, that's coming through that water and effectively controlling a lot of the EPS the EPS on the membrane. And here we can see without the UV, uh, the, the EPS in the membrane, and with the, UV, with the UV, the lack of it. So here's an example, a study that uh, Plant Bowen, uh, is this in Cartersville, Alabama. It came in from the Red River going into a makeup pond. From the makeup pond, it goes into a contact clarifier. From a contact clarifier, it goes into a multimedia filter. From the multimedia filters, we go into um, trial number one, where they wanted to just look at simple dechlorination disinfection. Then from there, it went to the micron filters, uh, the high pressure pump, the RO. And what we didn't realize is uh, later, we, we, when we should draw, have drawn in your cations, your anions, and your mixed beds. 
because later we found that the efficiency was so good that we're also giving benefits to the ion exchange resins. Now I say trial one because trial one was simply the demonstrating dechlorination disinfection. But trial two, you could take some of that part of the system out, put it at the front end, take out part of your chlorine demand um, at the front end. So the on the back end, you can have a system that's controlling a lot less free available chlorine. So what I'm saying is at a at 1,000 millijoules per centimeter squared, it takes a smaller system to treat 0.2 ppm free available chlorine than 2.0 free available chlorine. So here's the system itself in trial one. You can see we three systems were brought in here. So one, two, three. Um, there's the control panel itself. And here's the results. This is the wet chemistry test. As from the wet chemistry test, we can see it was coming in at 1.5 pp, ppm. And indeed, we had less than non-detect or less than 0 0.01 coming in. This is an automatic continuous meter. It was uh, measured at 1.81. And at one point in time, it got as high as 2.2 ppm free available chlorine, and all of it was removed. When you look at traditional UV, traditional UV was struggling to get down to 0.1 available um, free available chlorine. And indeed, with the HOD UV, we're consistently at non-detect or less than 0.01. So after three years later, after we demonstrated the success of that the technology could, could dechlorinate and disinfect, uh, three years later. And here's the, here's a, we took the data from their log sheets, took pictures of them, and put them into a normalization analysis, a membrane normalization analysis. And the first thing is, is here's the pressure drop. Of course, when you look at the pressure drop, you see in a typical, typical system, the pressure would slowly increase, then you'd have to do a CIP, uh, it would, then it would slowly increase again, do another CIP, and over time, when you do six to 10 CIPs, uh, the membrane gets uh, uh, damaged or, or, or eventually do a biofouled where it needs to be replaced. Well, three years later, the pressure drop across the system is flatlined. Prior to looking at the HODUV in this application, the uh, plant Bowen did four to five CIPs per year. At the pract practically at the end of three years, the membrane was heavily fouled where they had to replace it, uh, replace the membrane. At the end of three years or at the end of this, at the time of this study, the membrane was acting as if it's a brand new membrane. There is a, the, the pressure drop across the membrane went, went from 28 PSI to 30, 32 PSI, and typically it was above 50 PSI at this point in time. And again, when you look at the salt passage and the salt reject, the membrane is acting as if it's a brand new membrane. So why is this significant? It's significant because when they looked at the holistic view of their chemical program, um, the, the cost of their chemical program was $65,000 per year. When they got a quote from a traditional, from a company that supplied a traditional UV, and they said they wanted to get down to 0 0.01, the capital cost of the system was $750,000, and the operating cost was eighty dollars to $90,000. When you look at $80,000 versus $65,000, you could see that from an op operating standpoint, it was more expensive so really, nobody really studied dechlorination in front of an RO membrane in a power plant because of these costs. When you look at the HODUV, the CapEx and the installed cost was 180000 but the operating cost was $20,000. That's a $45,000 savings. When you apply that to the $180,000, they had a three to four year payback. And because it was under five years at the time, uh, they went ahead and moved forward the study to to look at the look at the look at the technology. Well, after three years of operating, something extraordinarily is extraordinary is happening because the membrane is acting as if it's brand new. They're seeing that the membrane will last longer. Uh, one, it's controlling the EPS, but secondly, it's starting to remove some of the TOC 
And there's several elements that could be occurring. It, it may be a medium pressure lamp, but the medium pressure lamp is taking out both the UV and the medium pressure lamp is taking out the, 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 some of the TOC, whether it's by creating the hydroxyl radicals or by um, mem allowing the membrane to perform better, the TOC is reducing. It's also extended the life between the regenerations of the uh, ion exchange beds and particularly the anion beds. And for this, after three years, they reduced the payback to less than two years. But more importantly, it was some amazing discoveries that they want to go back and look look at the application to see what exactly is happening. And, and some feel that it could actually could be less than a, a one-year payback. Let me show you a, a, a corn oil refinery in Lubbock, Texas. They put the system in front of an RO plant. Um, it's a remote location. So it's common at this plant to overfeed bisulfite because they didn't have anyone at the, at the location to to control everything. At the end of uh, uh, almost a practically at the end of a year, they did a membrane autopsy analysis. And what they saw uh, on the membrane itself, there was no significant amount of fouling present. More importantly, there was no oxidative damage being seen. And finally, there was no significant amount of bacteria on the membrane. Remember, they replaced this membrane every every year. And now, after one year, the membrane is acting as if it's brand new. Because of the success at this plant and another plant, this organization has elected to standardize on the HOD UV worldwide in their, their, their fleets and have ordered several of these systems. I'd like to show you one more example at a, a Midwest generating station. Here, they did not add chlorine to the, to the system, so they did not need to remove they did not need to dechlorinate. But what they were doing, they were adding biocide uh, before then. They'd like to eliminate the use of biocide. And generally, they just wanted to get a feel for the piece of equipment and the ease of, ease of use. So we set it up to be a disinfection, disinfection around 50 to 150 millijoules. This uh, facility was on Lake Michigan water uh, or using Lake Michigan water. So because it's now disinfection, we can see the system is smaller on the one side, and then you see the RO membrane on the other, and here's the, uh, the system in, on, again on the bottom side. What was unique about this application is they had all the, the data prior to the HODUV study, and they, and, and they used the use of biocide. And when you look at the salt passage, they could see that the with the use of the biocide in the past practice, the, the, the salt passage would slowly start to degrade. But using the HODUV, the membrane was flatlined, uh, acting really strong. As you look at the salt rejection, again, using the biocide, the membrane started to, the performance started to, 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 to degrade. And with the salt rejection, it was flatlined. This over here is the flow rate, and the flow rate gen, um, varies. But when you look at the differential pressure of the biocide, you can see it's slowly starting to degrade. When you look at the HODUV, it was the pressure remained flat. But when you look here, it slowly started to rise. And I'll point out that it was, again, Lake Michigan water, and this was during the middle, middle of winter and when you get the cold water coming in. And later, as the cold water, as, as the warm water warmed up, uh, the differential pressure stayed stable. Now, prior to the HODUV, the membrane lasted about seven years. And they did about a CIP once a year. So it wasn't, it wasn't that significant. But what we got excited by was this. By using the HODUV, we used 21% less energy uh, over the use of biocide to pump that across that, that membrane. And more importantly, we had an 18% increase in permeate flow, which calculated out to be a, an increase, of, a, a, 30, a reduction in 33% power per thousand gallons produced. Now, one note in passing, the membrane that was used with the, 
when they installed the HODUV, they changed up the membranes during the replacement. It was uh, had an 8.8% increased surface area. It was slightly larger, but if bacteria was the issue, or as bacteria is often the issue, uh, the sl slightly increased the surface area didn't wouldn't add that much advantage to uh, bacterial biofouling. And indeed, the company recognized uh, reduced control of the biofouling in the membrane. They eliminated the use of the biocide. Uh, they, uh, well, they're, they feel generally they're going to extend the life of the RO membrane and reduce the uh, number of CIPs. They did reduce the number of uh, micron filter replacements, and it was ease of use. Finally, I'm going to show you a hydroelectric facility with some amazing results. At the lower Colorado River is Parker Dam. Parker Dam um, wanted to control the quagga mussels inside the, the facility, but when the quagga mussels got into the dam itself or into the water itself, it, it cleared up the water. As it cleared up the water, they got a lot of biofouling in addition to the macrofouling. So on the cooling water loop itself, we, saw, we installed the HOD UV systems, and you can see the, the problems of quagga mussels in the pipes. Uh, this is the system itself. It came to a strainer through the HOD UV and into the cooling water loop itself. But this is the amazing results. The Parker Dam has 16 heat exchangers. Every year, a thermal couple would go off in each one of those 16 heat exchangers, forcing them to take the exchangers offline. And, and you can see they had to mechanically clean every one of these uh, heat exchangers um, every year, both for macro, the uh, quagga muscle fouling itself, and the micro fouling. When they put the HODUV system on it, uh, the th um, none of them oh, went off to to be cleaned, mechanically cleaned. In this example here, the gasket had failed, so they took the system out of uh, out because of the gas you know, gasket failing to replace the gasket. But when they looked at the picture, the macro and micro biofouling was reduced. This produced a, a, an ROI for them of less than two years. And indeed, we're controlling the micro biofouling itself uh, inside the system, and you can see in the top bio box and the and the top. Uh, the hydrozoas and bryozoas that were forming on the, on, on the side of the, the tank and the, the slime forming on the bottom and nothing on the, the side of the tank. And with that, I'll open up with any questions, uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis, um, for that a lot of information on HOD, so we really appreciate it. We also appreciate you giving us a few extra minutes for question and answers. So for those of you, if you have a question and you haven't written it down yet, please write it down now. And uh, Dennis, I'm going to turn this back over to Dennis. Dennis will read your question so that everyone knows what the question is, and then he'll give an answer. Okay, thank you. And the first question is, I have a client that discharges 1,500 ppm, yes, 1,500 ppm of chlorine to the environment. Can I use UV254 nanometer to reduce this chlorine to zero ppm? Well, that's a, that's a challenge. That's certainly a lot. Um, and, and, and particularly, um, I guess what I would approach this, this question is, you want, when you look at dechlorination, you want to protect a high-valued asset. When you're discharging to the environment, um, you can use a lot of sodium, sodium metabisulfite or bisulfite to reduce the, uh, the free available chlorine into the environment. And it's not really protecting, protecting anything other than the, the discharge itself. Um, that's a that's a very expensive application. For even when you're looking at uh, something as efficient as the HODUV, that's a, that's a high volume of, um, of of free available chlorine to remove, and um, and I don't see that to be impractical. I'm not too sure. I'm sure from a, a bench scale work it was studied, uh, but from a practical level, um, it, it, it probably doesn't make it, it probably doesn't make sense. Okay, the next question. Where are the installations and applications at industrial facilities? 
Well, when you look at the uh, HOD for dechlorination and disinfection in industrial facilities, I would say the one industry that has really studied it the most is the corn oil refining market. Uh, the corn oil refining market, some of the large food and beverage industries in the world, several of them have studied the systems uh, at locations. Uh, one particular, um, the largest one, has studied it extensively at several facilities at Lubbock, Chattanooga, and Deerfield they have installed the systems. Also installed them at Decatur, uh, Enderlin, and uh, Frankfurt, Indiana. Uh, but because of their work, a lot of their competitors started to take notice and have installed it in Mapleton um, and in several, and also in Decatur. So uh, for whatever reason, there's a lot of studies done. They don't share a lot of their information. It's a very, uh, uh, seems like a very, uh, competitive industry, so they don't like to share their data. Uh, unfortunately, we don't share it with us, but what we do see is uh, that they've adopted the technology and moving it forward. In power industry, we see it in the, in the south, south, um, southeast at Plant Bowen, Plant Harris. We've seen it at, uh, at, uh, in the Midwest. Uh, I'm going to say roughly about uh, six to seven facilities in the power industries. And uh, hopefully with presentations like this, we get more recognition. I think, let me just add one more thing here that I think is really exciting about this technology. Again, because of the, 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 the cost, it, the UV has really never been studied with such efficiency as it's been studied here with this technology. And because of things with, with this new information, I don't think we're no, we'll really know how strong or how valued this technology is going to be until we get 10 systems operating for 10 years. Because even after the first four years of operating at Plant Boeing, we're getting new discoveries. And these discoveries are amazing. And, you know, how are we controlling the, the, um, the TOC reduction? Why are we controlling the EPS? Why, why is it being so uh, strong and effective and these membranes are acting as, as, as if they're brand new? So, I think that's exciting, very, very exciting. Uh, we got several systems up and going now, uh, over a dozen or well, more than a dozen. Um, and as more results come out, uh, hopefully we'll have uh, other opportunities to share that information with you. The next question. Does the UV have an effect on anti-scaling chemicals? Should anti-scalants be added after the UV? Well, that's a great question because uh, the, the UV at that concentration energy uh, could have an effect on the anti-scalant. And what we recommend is the anti-scalant be added after the HOD UV um, for several reasons. The for, for first, yes, there's a lot of energy being put into the water and, uh, and the anti-scalant itself uh, it could and would be affected. Um, but more importantly, if you did it before the UV, uh, the lamp itself is a heat source. So some of that anti-scalant uh, could could come out on the the heat source itself. So it's best to to apply the anti-scalant after the HOD UV. What was the flow velocity of the system at the dam? Well, we have that's in the hydroelectric facilities, um, and particularly because of the results we showed you at Parker Dam. We have uh, several installations in, uh, in operation, and I'll say it's, it's now to the stage of adoption because of its, uh, the HOD's effectiveness. At that particular facility, it was 1,500 GPM through the 10-inch uh, through the, uh, uh, 10 system. Uh, at, uh, at Davis Dam, it's uh, 3,500 GPM. At Tuver Dam, it's about 1,200 or 1,500 GPM. But certainly we have them with the Army Corps of Engineers has now uh, have installations installed, um, the Salt River Project. And I'm going to say the ranges have been anywhere between um, 500 to 5,000 GPM uh, in the system. Now the system sizes can vary. Uh, the HOD, currently the HOD technology is is um, sized in four inch diameter systems, six inch diameter systems, 10 inch diameter systems, uh, 14. Uh, recently, we're coming out with a 24 inch diameter system and a 36 inch diameter system. Next question. With the intent of killing MIC, M I C, bacteria, or with the intent of killing MIC bacteria at the intake of a service water system at a nuclear plant, Will the HOD 
UV system inadvertently, prematurely dechlorinate the service water system? Will we be able to kill bacteria without dechlorinating? Well, the answer is yes. Um, when we, in our studies, what we've seen when we look at uh, MYC or the iron-reducing bacteria, and, there, and there's a suite of them, we've seen that the worst offender can be controlled with a dose of 40 millijoules per centimeter squared. So when we look at 40, 40 millijoules per centimeter squared, that's roughly your, a simple disinfection dose. And, and oftentimes when you see uh, applications, again, 40 millijoules is a simple disinfe disinfection dose and indeed can control the MYC or the iron-reducing bacteria. Now go back to dechlorination. Dechlorination requires a whole lot of energy to dissociate that oxygen from that, 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 that chloride ion. So in a thousand millijoules. So uh, essentially you can disinfect the water without really having much effect on dechlorinating or taking out the free available chlorine. Again, because the free available chlorine is a thousand, a uh, simple disinfection is 40 or you know, 100 millijoules or less. Um, uh, so even though you're controlling the bacteria, you're not really able to dechlorinate. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll go back to, I think when you look at this science, I'm, I'm excited by this. And it's the application theory that I'm most excited about. Now that you have a piece of equipment that's, that's so efficient in delivering the energy into the water, um, I think we, we need to take a step back. And we take a step back, and I, and I say that about the application theory. How can we use this technology to, to make these systems perform better? Of course, we looked at Plant Bowen. When you, when you take the application theory itself and you say, okay, I want to dechlorinate and disinfect prior to an RO membrane. That's one theory. And, and as we see, it's working. It's working really well, and we're, we're gaining a lot of information and, and new discoveries. But the other one is, uh, could, when we look at MIC itself, we could put one system at the raw water intake. And indeed, we did at, a, at another power plant facility. We put one at the raw water intake, and that one's operating right around 80 millijoules, 80 to 100 millijoules. So we're disinfecting the water, we're taking out the chlorine demand. We're, we're able to control the chlorine down to uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, um, and, and, and feed it after the HODUV. And more importantly, it's it's a firewall to prevent MYC, the microbial induced corrosion uh, uh, bacteria, from getting into the system itself. So once once we put it to, at the beginning at the raw water intake. In this particular plant, they have a very uh, complex water treatment plant, and indeed the water goes in other locations. So they had to add chlorine back into the water because they had several wide spots in the line. But now by taking out the chlorine demand, they can keep it at 0.1, uh, free available 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So when it gets just before the RO membrane and they want to dechlorinate, they can use a UV system or an HOD UV that's essentially low at a, at a lot smaller uh, a smaller capital cost, cost or smaller capital equipment to remove the um, to remove that level. Also, hey. could use it in balance with a with a balanced chemistry program. Uh, next question: What dose did you use for muscle? Well, that's a, a, a again for muscles. It was generally accepted that uh, um, 100 millijoules per centimeter squared was was commonly accepted. I mean, there's some range between 100 and 150 millijoules, depending on the trade journal that you um, that you that you that you read uh, out there, and that's that really applies to traditional UV. And and again, as we took the HOD UV and we set it for the exact same 100 millijoules per centimeter squared. Um, essentially, the system was through. We had extraordinary results. Basically, we had 100% control. But they looked to optimize the system. And again, as they optimized the system, they brought it down to uh, to uh, 80, to to 60, to 40, down to 20. And indeed, uh, the hydroptic chambers concentrated it, so it's mimicking um, that 100 to 150 millijoules, depending on the journal that you read. That's needed to, you know, the, the independent studies that are done saying uh, a quagga muscle velager needs that much energy to, to to control it, to inactivate it, and so our hydroptic chambers are are meeting that uh, that 
that hundred millijoules inside those chambers. But when you're actually looking at the energy coming out of the lamp itself, um, we can get as low as 20, but indeed we're, we, we like some conservative and we, we designed maybe 40 or something higher a little bit just to, uh, uh, depending on the flow or, or other situations. The next question is, can this technology reduce THMs? Great question. Um, I'm working more in the power, energy, and industrial, and, and we've never really studied that. But I know when uh, uh, the, Atlant uh, the Atlantium group, um, Phyllis Posey, has been working in the municipal group. And, and uh, particularly in the municipal group, uh, uh, HODUV and UV is heavily studied for THMs. Um, generally, uh, I'm not an expert in this particular this particular field, but uh, looking at this field in the past, anytime you use HOD UV or UV, um, particularly when the HOD can get down to four log removal, I think that's what's particularly attractive about the HOD UV is now you can use, you don't have to use the, the, the chemistry in the first place that can cause some of those disinfection byproducts issues. So if you can actually rely on an HOD UV to get you four log removal and not have to use chemistry, then there's the advantage of controlling the THM. In some cases, you have to have a residual uh, inside there. So now if you're using uh, HOD UV getting four log removal, uh, the ability to have a residual is you're using a lot less chemistry uh, it, after the HOD UV to keep that residual in your system. And, and of course, with that, you get a lot less disinfection byproducts. But uh, I'm going to, if, if you'd like more information on that, uh, please reach out to us because Philip Posey is, uh, is an ex is very strong in the municipal market. Can you explain what you meant by UV apparatus in that equation? Yes, I think I, hopefully the, the, the equation of the, uh, in the presentation, uh, the UV apparatus, or the eight, the difference between the HOD UV and the um, and the um, and a traditional UV. In, in our case, the UV apparatus, uh, we have the hydro optic sections on each side of the chamber, uh, the which concentrates the energy. Um, the other part of it, we have in the UV apparatus, we have the sensors, logic, and controls. The medium pressure lamp, so it's the sum to sum of the different technologies used to create the UV technology uh, versus why in that equation the minus side for traditional UV there's a lot of inefficiencies in traditional UV. Uh, of course, the metal metal absorbs the energy. Uh, oftentimes, um, plates or baffles are used or trying to spin the fluid to get the uh, the water in front of the UV. Again. Tr uh, creative ways to get it closer to the lamps or more importantly the more lamps are being added to there to get in front of the the water in front of the lamps um, all those that turbulence creates issues the baffles the metals create issues so that's why it's more of a, more of a detraction okay will hod remove chloramines also in ro feed water great question i think this is a really good question more studies need need to be done with chloramines i we we did an example with chloramines, um, and indeed, we, it can remove chloramines. The HOD will remove chloramines, but it do, also does it at a much higher energy than free available chlorine. Um, in a one study that we did, it was higher energy and we were successful. But more importantly, what we also learned in talking to the membrane manufacturers themselves, the chloramines uh, don't need to be controlled. They can have a higher amount of a uh, of chloramine going out to the membrane than, than, than free available chlorine. It doesn't have that oxidative, that damaging potential that free available chlorine does. Um, I'm st still like to explore this question because how much chloramines can go to a membrane? Uh, and, and then with that equation, do we really need, to, even though we need to put more energy into the water, our system would be, uh, uh, so sized a bit bigger to take out chloramines, but is that is that really necessary? Um, we haven't, we've installed one system where we're taking out uh, 80 to 90 percent of the chloramines and the membrane is acting as if it's brand new. So that's quite successful um, and the energy levels is, is consistent with what the energy levels of removing free available chlorine. 
so we're not taking out all the chloramine in that example, it, uh, and it's having no effect on the membrane itself. So that's a great question. I'd like to see more of those, those applications done. Uh, how does the water velocity affect the treatment? Um, in our in our example, the HODUV, we want laminar flow in our pipes. So the laminar flow allows the energy to be um, uh, well. The hydro the hydro optic sections um, is handled by the laminar flow. Uh, or that excuse me, let me take, take a step back. Um, the hydro optic sections work in the work by themselves in the sense that if we have laminar flow, uh, the, the wavelengths are able to bounce around inside effectively throughout the hydro, hydro optic chambers. If we start creating um, a turbulent flow, then it, it, dis, it, it removes some of the efficiency of the hydro optic chambers. So we'd like to size the equipment so it's more laminar flow. To get more laminar flow, we, we put um, uh, some pipe diameters, pre-pipe and post diameters of equal length to the system itself, again, to achieve more of a laminar flow. Um, uh, as far as the velocities itself, um, we try to match up, um, I don't know if we exactly have a number for velocity, simply because it's based upon the UV transmittance of the water as well. Uh, the UV transmittance, the flow rate, uh, and then what exactly are we trying to control? Are we trying to control a simple bacteria like Legionella or E. coli, or are we actually trying to do dechlorination at a thousand millijoules? So there's a lot of things that come into sizing the system. Okay, the next question is, is ozone ever used as pretreatment for ROs? Well, a great question. That's something that um, I, I don't have a lot of experience in, in the traditional market with it used in the past, and indeed, uh, familiar that o ozone ha has been and is being used. But I can share with you, we're doing more recent studies with ozone and actually displacing ozone. I know in one uh, one power plant, they're using ozone to control the uh, zebra mussels. And the challenge is, is as they use it at the proper amount, that the, or the level at the level needed to control the zebra mussels, they find degassing off of the ozone inside the power plant, and that's creating um, creating certain uh, health and safety issues for the for the plant themselves. The HODUV is a perfect alternative to replace it um, instead of using the ozone itself. And indeed, to prevent the health and safety issues inside the plant, they reduce the uh, the levels lower. Uh, the concentration lower uh, of the ozone lower, and when they do that, they're not effectively removing the uh, the zebra mussels themselves. So we're doing some studies on comparing HODUV versus ozone, and having some very interesting effects there. Okay, uh, I think that was the last question. Um, thank you, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present and talk with you today. Okay, this is David again. If your question wasn't answered during the Q&A session, Dennis will answer by email. Um, so if, and if you have any other questions, please contact Dennis as well. So just for your information, we at DHP have lots of different training, including UV. So if uh, you need any training, just give us a holler and we'd be happy to help you out. So again, thank you for attending. Uh, please answer the three questions on the survey. It'll be emailed to you right after this webinar. It'll only take a few seconds. Thanks so much. See you at the next webinar. Bye-bye.